Good morning, everyone. It is lovely to see you this morning. Welcome to our new series. Welcome to Riverside Vineyard. This is new to you. So this is our garden. We love our garden. And those of you that know us, we, you know that we love gardening and all of that kind of thing. Right-hand side there, that is our summer house. That is a beautiful place for dumping stuff. <laughs> Barbecue, seat cushions and stuff like that. Um, nine days ago, it got a bit windy, right? Storm Eunice. This happened to our summer house shed. Click. So the whole of the top section, the whole of the roof, ended up in next door's garden. Nobody was hurt, fortunately. What we found out was when our summer house was taken apart and moved a few years ago, the roof wasn't reattached to the sides. Okay? So... It all looked great from the outside, but there was an issue going on under the surface. Have you seen the movie Titanic? You know, Leonardo DiCaprio, Kate Winslet, Celine Dion hitting some top notes. First movie, apparently, that hit the $1 billion mark. I have to make an admission, I've not watched it all the way through. I have... I've dipped in and out, and there are lots of reasons for that, but let me tell you one, and it's a bit of a spoiler alert, the boat sinks. So it's sort of like a predictable outcome, and so it's kind of lost my attention already, I'm afraid. So, But in the movie, what what you see is this amazing luxury on the top decks, right? Everything looks really good, and even after hitting the iceberg, they're oblivious Life still is going on great on the surface. But below decks was a very different story. And this icy water was rushing in, and very soon, the issues that started out of sight below decks rise to the upper deck. And thinking about that story, here's a quote from a book uh, by a pastor in New York called Rich Villadas, who we're going to be dipping into through this series. He writes this, Sooner or later... The issues on life's lower decks, though we remain oblivious, will nevertheless rise to the top. Below decks in our lives, we all hold values and beliefs and attitudes that were formed in us, often from early years, from our families, from our cultures, from our education, from experiences. And some of this inner formation in our lives was good and godly, And some of it wasn't. So, for example, if we were brought up in a household where there may be an angry parent, anger may have been normalized in our formation. And now we can find there is this inner rage just below the surface. Maybe how we thought about people of different colors and ethnicities was part of our formation in a a good way or in a not-so-good way. Maybe our attitudes towards people of a different gender, you know, our thoughts and beliefs around that. Maybe we were in a household where we were told, the man is the top dog. You know, whether or not he's got any more wisdom than anybody else, and maybe he hasn't, but just because of a chromosomal difference, that's the head, rather than being formed by a biblical understanding of mutual submission. And so we can be formed in these different attitudes to the people around us. And... Sooner or later, those things will come to the surface in different ways, way more often than we'd like them to, and however hard we try and keep them below the surface. So the question I want us to think about today is, what do you want to come out of your life? What do you want to come out of your life? If you're somebody like me that wants the life of Jesus to flow out of our lives, we need his life to be deeply formed within us. And so welcome to our new series, Inside Out. Over these next six weeks, we're going to explore how we can be more deeply formed by the life of Jesus. And so if you're here today, if you have someone that said yes to following Jesus, this is actually at the heart of what you and I signed up for that we would embrace this life, this abundant life that Jesus offers us to form us and reform us from the inside out. 
If you're here today and you say, well, I'm not yet a follower of Jesus, firstly, you are incredibly welcome. And secondly, I hope that one of the things that you hear is this incredible abundance of life that Jesus invites you into. And we can say yes to that life, to that hope, and that love today. And you would be so welcome to do that. So here are three ways that very quickly we can benefit most from this series. Firstly, would you plan to be with us every Sunday? So whether that be in person or for those online, but but put it in your diary. Secondly, be part of a small group. We're creating special materials for our groups. Rob and I and others have been uh, preparing those over the recent weeks. So would you commit to journeying with other people? And thirdly, really importantly, commit to journeying with Jesus. I'll say this again at the end. This series is not about trying harder. This is a series about taking hold of the transforming, redemptive love of Jesus Christ, journeying with him. So I would love to just take a moment to pause and ask each one of us to pray for our own lives. So when I pray for myself, I put my hand on my heart. You're welcome to do that. Do what works for you, but I would just love to pray for us now. Jesus, thank you for this moment in our lives and in our church's life where we are going to really dig deep into this abundant life that you have for us. Lord, thinking about the ways that we have been formed and Lord, reaching out for your redemptive love to transform and reform us. And so Jesus, we give our yes in advance to you. Those things that you're wanting to do through your great love and the power of your spirit, we say yes in advance. Lord, would you be powerfully at work in our lives? In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what I'm going to do today is set a scene, set a foundation for our series. And I'm going to do that through um, a few verses in the book of Galatians. If you've got a Bible... Um, please do be turning to uh, the letter to the Galatians. It was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, probably to churches that he had himself planted or certainly been involved in establishing them. And as you read through the book of Galatians, yeah, there's there's a greeting in the first few verses. You're like, Paul, hi, how are you? You very quickly feel his frustration. So this is verses 6 and 7. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So what has seems to have happened is the gospel of Jesus has started to bring transformation, reformation into their lives, but they had drifted away from that simple message of grace. And they were saying, people were saying that, um, that a number of Old Testament ceremonial practices were still needed on top of a belief in Jesus Christ. And so if you jump onto Galatians chapter 4, you see um, Paul commenting on that. So from verse 8, he says, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it? that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. So they were being distracted by what we might call a cosmetic gospel or an outside-in gospel that said that faith in Jesus was not enough. You needed to add all of this other stuff, this external cosmetic stuff, observance of special holy days, maintenance of Jewish customs, if you were a guy, circumcision. And Paul, can you, can you hear him? It's kind of like, no, no. God's life works inside out, not outside in. It's an inside out gospel. And so I'm going to read, he, he, he really hammers this home in verses 19 and 20. And this is what we're just going to dwell in for a few minutes this morning. Nine, verses 19 and 20 of chapter 4. My dear children, you can see his pastoral heart now. You can, we've seen his frustration, right? <laughs> My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until 
Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Let me share three things from these verses. The first is, is that the goal, the goal of our lives is for Christ to be formed in us. Christ to be, in every part of us, our thoughts, our emotions, our actions, our attitudes, the acts of our will in every part. You know, think back to the Titanic movie, but this time picture the iceberg. And you'll know probably the icebergs, 10% are above the surface, 90% are below the surface. Jesus wants to transform the entirety of our beings, not just the 10% above the surface that other people see. And here, I believe, is a challenge for us. What I want to suggest is that in lots of ways, the world we live in is really shallow is really shallow. We live in a culture of shallowness. For example, we live in a world that is dominated by media and highly manipulated by social media and the image of ourselves that we put out there. So a survey, fairly recent survey, found that 48% of people choose their holiday destination based upon the Instagram ability of photos. 48%, almost half of the people make a decision about their holiday based upon what photos they can take and what they can put out on their Instagram. Shallow. If you read most people's profiles on social media, you'd think their lives were utterly amazing. Utterly amazing. And yet we know, don't we, because... We we know it's true for us that just under the surface, most of us are all struggling with habits we'd rather not have, with addictions in different ways, with sin, with guilt, and with shame. The shallowness of our world's value system places a huge worth on things like accomplishments and possessions. So think about this. You know, do we really think, you know, you might be very proud of the car that you drive. Do you think Jesus is that bothered? Wow, you drive that? Or, you know, maybe we have kind of like, we've built up some savings or we've got a bank balance and we kind of think, do you think Jesus is that impressed? You know, the, you know, the, one, the one that holds the whole of the resources of the whole cosmos in his hands looks at your bank balance and thinks, wow. Or your job title. You know, king of kings, lord of lords looks at the title in your business card and thinks, wow, you've done so well. It's shallow, isn't it? There's a shallowness in the world around us. And I simply want us to be aware that we live in a culture that is fashioned by shallowness. Yet the call on followers of Jesus Christ is to be deeply formed by the life of Jesus. So it's counter-cultural to the world that we live in. So that's the first thing. The goal is to be formed to be like Christ. The second thing is that transformation is supposed to be normal for Christians. Verse 20, Paul writes, I'm perplexed about you. In other words, he says, I don't get it. I just don't get what's going on in your lives. His clear expectation is that there would be evidence of transformation in the lives of followers of Jesus Christ. And so I say this with a huge amount of love and graciousness because I I do love you. And you, that's probably a relief because I'm a pastor. And if, like, <laughs> if Christ isn't being formed in us, if our lives aren't changing for the better, something's gone wrong because that's the norm. That, that's the pastoral expectation that Paul writes to us about in this letter. That's the norm. But there is always hope for us if we've become stalled or stuck in our lives or haven't yet embraced the life of Jesus, we can do so today. We can make a new start today. You know, in the vineyard, we've said for years and years and years, come as you are, but don't stay as you are. It's an invitation that says you are welcome, but you're welcome into a journey of transformation and reformation because God is here by his spirit and he is reforming us for the life of Jesus to be deeply formed in us. 
And the third thing I want to share is this whole idea of transformation and reformation is really important. It's really important that we explore this. Verse 19, can you feel Paul's pain? He likens it to childbirth. Now, I have it on good authority that childbirth is quite painful. And I'm not going to go any further down that line because I get into trouble. But this, there's a strength to his language. Like he says, take this seriously. Take this seriously. Let me just share personally. These last two years, this last two years of COVID-19, have been an incredibly challenging and pastorally painful season. And let me share personally, it's been so painful for for me and others on our team and other leaders in our church to see people who were doing well as followers of Jesus just slide away. And in lots of different ways, put self and comfort at the center of their world rather than Christ, his church, and his cause. And let me just say, what brings me most joy as a pastor is when people like you are changing for the better. When you're taking hold of something of the life of Jesus and and something is being reformed, and I hear stories, that brings me joy. So if you want to make my life happy, take the life of Jesus. Take hold of that life, okay? Now, at the heart of this series of Inside Out is for us to take time to think about how we have been formed and how we are being transformed and reformed by Jesus Christ. And rather than just looking above the decks of our lives, it's so important that we look below decks. What's going on in the dark corners of your life, of my life? What's going on there? It's an invitation to explore those places with the help of God. Is there guilt that we feel? Is there shame that we feel? Are there places where our attitudes and behaviors have been stuck, have become stuck in some way? And so over these next six weeks, we're going to explore five areas of life, asking the Lord to deepen his transforming work in us. And one of the resources that I'll just point to that we've been helped as we've been exploring this for ourselves is this book by Rich Villadas entitled The Deeply Formed Life. I would highly recommend this. This is one of the best books that I have read over recent years, particularly in this area of formation and discipleship. It is really, really good. So we're going to explore how we can put in place really good rhythms and practices in what is a very busy world. We're going to think about sex in a world that separates body from soul, how we can live holistic, good lives in in our physical bodies and in the area of sex. We're going to think about how we can be different together. We're going to explore our racial and ethnic formation and how we can minister reconciliation. We're going to think about how we can truly live deeply formed lives in a shallow world. And we're going to explore how we can be meaningfully present in a world that is highly distracted. And that's a challenge, right? Distractions everywhere. How can we be actually present in our world? So we're excited for this journey together. We're expectant of the Lord being powerfully at work in our lives. And let me say two reasons why I'm... Well, let me share why I'm I'm expecting about that. I'm expecting about it because Jesus says that's the case. John chapter 5, Jesus said that the Father is always at work. He's always at work. So we can be expectant of him always being at work in our lives. The question is, is are we going to take a look and see what he's doing? And so one of the songs that we've sung over recent years, you know the song Miracle Worker? I love, I think it's, I don't know, technically it's the bridge or chorus or something in that. It says this, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. My experience has been is that a whole lot of the transformation and reformation that I've experienced in my life, I couldn't put my point on, my finger on a point when it happened. I just know that Jesus has been at work in the however many years I've been following him. And so we can be expectant of him being at work because he never stops working in our lives. So, 
How can we be most open to what the Lord is wanting to do in our lives? I'm going to share three ways that I think can really help position us for what Jesus is wanting to do in our lives in this season, and then we'll pray with and for one another. So the first thing is with God's help, take a look below decks. Take a look under the surface in your life. Let me share just something that happened to me this past week. Last Monday, I woke up in the morning just feeling really anxious. Like, like really, really anxious. And at the same time, I know that repeatedly in the Gospels, Jesus says to his disciples, and that means to people like me, don't worry. And so I'm held with these two things. There is all of this stuff going on in my body and heart saying I'm really anxious. And at the same time, I know that Jesus says, do not worry. So one of the things that that tells me is that there is something beneath the surface in my life that isn't formed into the fullness of Jesus yet. I'm not the finished article, just in case you were wondering. There is something that is not fully formed yet and that needs to be transformed in my life. And so one of the things that I've been doing this week is actually in the Lectio 365, if you're following that, it was in this morning's um, Lectio 365 app. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24 says this, Search me, God, and know my heart. That's an invitation for God with us to explore what's going on beneath the decks of our lives. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So what is the Lord wanting to transform and reform in your life in this season? Maybe just as I'm speaking now, you just take this moment and say, Holy Spirit, just if there's something you want to do in my life, would you let me know? What are you putting your finger on? What are you highlighting? What is coming to your mind even in this moment? Because that might just be the Lord speaking to you, catching your attention about something. So would you ask him? That's the first way that we can position ourselves powerfully for this season, is simply to say to the Lord, search my heart. Search my heart. I, I, I want to be more deeply formed in the life of Jesus Christ. Search my heart. Would you, would you, would you pray that? Would you journey in that way? The second way is to journey with other people. Please make sure that you're part of a small group, at the very least for this series, so that you don't miss out. But more importantly, and I was reading some really interesting stuff this week, we actually need other people around us in order to change. It's not just you, it's you and others and the power of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, it's more than just ourselves. And, and so this is some of the stuff that I was reading. It's from these guys at Harvard University, a couple of researchers called Robert Keegan and Lisa Leahy. And what they've written about is something that they call immunity to change. And immunity to change is described as an inability to change because of deep-rooted assumptions that may be so entrenched that they are unconscious to us. In other words, there is often stuff in our lives that we do not see for ourselves. Blind spots. Behaviors that we have just become so used to that they feel normal, right? Most of the behaviors in our lives, we normalize them because none of us wants to feel abnormal. So we, we rationalize them, we recalibrate so that that things become normal. And what we actually need is to invite others to get into a place of accountability where we'll invite others to say, what do you see? Can you help me? Because I don't want to be immune to change. I want to be open to change. I want to, to posture myself so that the Holy Spirit and the redemptive love of God can really get into the depths of my soul. And I know that I need other people around me for that to become more possible. So would you do that in this season? But above all, we need the help of God, don't we? I've said this at the start. Would you, during this series, and beyond it, say yes to the transforming power of God's redemptive love? 
You know, that idea of redemption is that something that is broken can be redeemed and restored and made whole again. And I love that because that's what the love of God does for us. And so this series is not about trying harder. Please don't set off on that way. I've tried that. Has anyone, I'm not going to ask for an indication. Anyone else tried really hard to be a better follower of Jesus? And I'm not saying we don't put effort in, right? Grace is opposed to earning, not effort, okay? We can't earn the love of God, but we can put ourselves in places where we are more positioned to receive and, and cooperate with the love of God in our lives. But it's not about trying harder. It doesn't work. This is about positioning ourselves, putting in place practices and rhythms so that the transforming power of God's redemptive love in Christ can be at work deeply within us every day of our lives. Amen? You up for a journey? It's going to be good. It's going to be good. I would love to pray and then we'll, we'll, we'll move into a time of ministry. But I want to start by just praying a prayer that says yes to Jesus. And we often do this, um, but I want to pray it again today. And so you may be here and you have been following Jesus for decades and decades and years and years, but it is still really important that, if you like, I think the most important thing that a disciple can say is yes to Jesus. And we keep on saying yes to him. And so I'm going to invite us to do that. But if you're here and you've not yet said yes to Jesus, it's a moment where you can say yes to him and to the life that he has for you. So I'm just going to invite us to bow our heads. And I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for the abundance of life that you have made possible for us through your life, death, and resurrection. Lord, thank you for the power of your love to transform our lives. Lord, I'm incredibly grateful that you didn't just leave me as I was, but that you keep on being at work in my life. So Lord, I'm sorry for those times where I mess up, where I get it wrong. Jesus, I reach out afresh today for your forgiveness. And Jesus, I reach out again today for the transforming, redemptive love that is in Christ. And I say yes to that. I say yes to your love. I say yes to your abundant life. I say yes to Jesus, your life being more deeply worked into me. I say yes to that. So Jesus, I ask that you would be at work in me through the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name.